Hi, I'm here today to share with you a case study on a vehicle that we had in the shop recently uh, that was very challenging and it uh, basically uh, you know, cost us a lot of time, but uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about it because I learned uh, quite a few things using some new tools. And to kind of make a long story short, this is a vibration problem. And basically what happened uh, was that we had a, a 2003 Chevrolet S10 pickup, extended cab, 4.3 liter automatic, uh, brought into us. And the story was that the vehicle had broke the drive shaft out on the road. He had the vehicle towed into another service center. They sourced a used drive shaft and uh, put it in the vehicle and it had a, a pretty radical vibration. And so the shop took the drive shaft out, sent it out to their uh, driveline service center. They balanced it. They indeed found that the drive shaft was out of balance and uh, put it back in the vehicle and the vibration was still there. Uh, we don't know if it changed at all, uh, but that, at that point, the, uh, the other shop just recommended that he take the vehicle to us. So it arrived in my shop. Service technician went out with a customer and drove it and uh, definitely felt a vibration and a technician felt that it was coming from the driveline uh, system. So I took the drive shaft or took the vehicle up in the air, started looking it over. And this vehicle has at the rear, it has a two piece drive shaft, but the rear section has a double carden joint at both ends. Okay. And uh, so the double carden joints, uh, they're kind of hard to check. So we went ahead and unbolted it from the companion plan at the trans or the differential. And we started kind of exercising them and feeling them and they didn't quite feel right. I mean, normally they, they should feel tight and kind of snap to one end, you know, as you roll them over that, uh, that ball. And uh, so we advised the customer that we should take the drive shaft and send it to our driveline guy and have him check it. He received the drive shaft. He looked it over. Uh, they said that the, the U joints were all you know, worn out and they needed to be replaced. So we went ahead and had them rebuild the drive shaft, balanced it, brought it back, put it in the car. And guess what? Vehicle still had a pretty bad vibration. So at that point, I decided to take the Pico scope and I've got the 4425 here, and I have the NVH three channel kit that I recently uh, acquired, but I had yet to actually experiment with it yet. And uh, usually what I like to do when I get a new tool is gain some familiarity with that tool so I understand how it works, what its limitations are. So I was really at forced at this point to learn while I was trying to diagnose the car. Not the ideal situation, but in this case, I was able to get through the application pretty well and get some data on the car. Since then, I've done some studying and I've uh, spoken with some folks out at Pico and uh, learned a lot more about the tool. So that's what I want to share with you. To make a long story short here, this vehicle actually had a bent pinion shaft. That was the original, that was the problem with this vehicle. Now the bent shaft, uh, we're not sure when that occurred, whether it was induced by the original drive shaft being uh, or failing, or did it fail because of, or, you know, the drive shaft was failed because of this unit being, um, uh, you know, out of brown. So I didn't have, I don't have a lathe here. So I sent this unit out to the machine shop and uh, had them put it in their lathe. And uh, our machinist reported back that he had 20 thousandths of run out in this, uh, this unit. So I was able to set it up on a turntable and pretty much zero out the uh, edge of the companion flange here uh, to, to within about two thousandths. And then I moved my dial indicator up here on the, uh, the outer bearing uh, surface. And you can see that I've got uh, probably about five or six thousandths of, of run out. So, so anyways, let's talk about the tool a little bit. Uh, you need the 4425 or a four channel scope to use the three channel interface. And basically the NVH uh, here, the interface has uh, channels X, Y, and Z. Those are connected to the PZO uh, accelerometer here. It's a three axis accelerometer. And so the channels that you have here, you have, uh, let me get my glasses on here. So you have X and that is four and aft. You have Z, that's side to side, 
and then Y is up and down. And so this unit comes with uh, a screw hole, quarter 20. That gives you reference that should be pointed to the front of the vehicle. It comes with a nice strong magnetic base that can actually unscrew and uh, screw into the front or the back or what have you, just so you can mount it on the vehicle so that it's, it's pointing the proper, the proper location. This magnet is very, very strong. And um, normally what you would do is just find the seat rail, either driver's side, passenger side, preferably towards the center, the, the inners. And you basically just sit it down on the uh, frame rail, big, strong magnet. So let's see if we can get a close up of this. So you can see the channels here, X, that's fore and aft, Y up and down, and Z side to side. So I've got the, uh, I've got the scope all hooked up here, and what I want to do is, is fire up the application. So let's uh, set that back on there. And we'll open up the app. When you fire up the application, uh, it will ask you if you want to start a new test or load a save test. And when you hit start a new test, it's going to load a wizard and kind of help you walk, uh, walk through the setup process. Uh, I'm going to load a save, save test and I'm going to kind of go through the, the setup uh, procedures here. So we're going to take uh, the, the before file. Okay. So we're loading that up and we're going to go back to the setup tab. So up here, um, you'll see that there's a box entry for engine RPM. So it's important that you get engine RPM into the, the unit or into the uh, Pico application, and you can do that a number of ways. So in this case, you know, when you're working on mostly OBD cars, uh, OBD2 cars, uh, you can load up, uh, load a, a J2534 device, plug it into a, an available USB port, or in this case, what I'm using is just a very inexpensive uh, Elm 327 interface scan tool. This has Bluetooth connectivity, uh, and you basically just plug it into the car and, and you, you need to sync up your Bluetooth with it, but once you get it connected, the software will see it. So there's your RPM input. You can also use any, uh, I mentioned before, J2534 interface. Now, if you don't have the availability to bring in an, uh, bring something in via scan tool, you can bring in a square wave or a tag signal into the available channel here. This is D, the fourth channel. And that will also you know, allow you to pick up that, that tachometer signal, and then you would dial it in here. If you don't have either one of those, you can take in the static RPM. And so say that you're driving the vehicle down the road and you have this all set up, and you're making note of what RPM this is occurring at and what mile per hour it's occurring at, then you can uh, just record those numbers and then come in and bring the software or bring the file up and modify that data. And we'll go over that here in just a second. All right, so the other thing here, you've got vibration signal. What type of uh, mode of operation are you gonna be in? We're gonna be in a three axis. There are the two, uh, the interface and the accelerometer. When you do get this package, uh, you'll need to work with your vendor that you buy it from to make sure that you get the, the two units married together because there is a licensing um, arrangement that you need to make sure you get set up with these things. So um, that is something that you need to make sure that you work with your vendor to get the, get the proper licensing all set up, okay? So you've got, um, you can actually change these axes uh, X, Y, and Z, but I recommend that you just leave those as default. Location, passenger compartment, you can also put some notes here, uh, you know, for later reference. So the, um, you know, the Elm is also picking up vehicle speed, and if you don't pick up vehicle speed, you can actually, um, you know, use the static RPM and note the, the miles per hour in the tachometer. Or if you want to bring in channel D, you can bring that in. And once you define the tire sizes, it will identify all of the other speeds of, of rotation of the components that you're, you're going to be analyzing. So the next page or next tab here will go to the vehicle details. This is a rear wheel drive. 
V engine six cylinders. There's the diff ratio, just put that in. Now the tires are important. Uh, on this car, this was a modified vehicle and it's lowered. It had aftermarket wheels and tires. Tire sizes were different. So when I first set this up, I went ahead and inputted the actual tires that were on the car. And what I found is that when I, after I road tested and collected data, the uh, orders of vibration didn't quite line up with the actual frequency that the, uh, the, the vibration was occurring. So what I later found out was that, yes, the tires were changed. However, the vehicle speedometer was not corrected for, and so it was reporting the wrong miles per hour into the, the tool here. However, it's got a real-time clock and it's looking at the frequencies that these vibrations are occurring and so therefore they didn't line up. So what I was able to do is go back uh, after I recorded the data and just changed the tire size and now I have everything all lined up properly. Uh, you also have a tire correction factor so if you're not getting things lined up exactly the way that they should be then you can go ahead and, and modify this. Uh, there is an advanced tab here where you can put, you, you can pick up that vehicle speed uh, through the tachometer and if you go in here and you define your gear ratio. So, you know, just go into your service information, find the gear ratios, input those, uh, make sure that, you know, the final drive and everything is correct and uh, you'll be all set. You can also do some analysis on pulley, uh, you know, com other components that are rotating and check for vibrations. So you can set up measurements for all of these other pulleys and you can do some custom stuff here too, as well. So we'll cancel out of that. And uh, so now let's just go into the, the recording. So when I fired up the vehicle, you know, I took it out for a road test and while you're running down the road, this bottom window that you see down here, right down here, this is the, the area of recording that we're analyzing uh, up in the top and you basically take this this little box here and you can define you know how wide this area is that you want to analyze okay and so what we're looking at up here we can see the this red blue and green those are the three channels and um, what we can do is we'll switch to default view and that's just one it's just looking at a sum of the uh, the three axes as they, they're pr producing uh, vibrations. So right away, and, and by the way, you can change the y-axis scaling by just clicking and dragging up and down here. So you see I was kind of off the chart there, so I could drop that down. And you can also drag here on your x-axis to kind of give you the, the range of what you really want to look at here. So we'll, we'll expand this out a little bit. And before we dive into this, I'm just going to go to the bar graph, which is sometimes is a lot more uh, simpler to, to look at. And you can see right away that P1, which is the prop shaft, first order of vibration. So a, a vibration kick, uh, you know, a severe vibration kick is occurring per revolution of this unit. If there was a, if this pulse was happening twice, like a harmonic that was multiplying, it would be called a second order vibration. And so you've got uh, P for prop shaft, you've got E for engine, and then we have T for tires. So right away you can look, you can see that we're, you know, the sum is like 94 here. We can drag this up a little bit. There's 94, 99.5 right over here, 100. And you can see the tires have, uh, you know, 28.9. So at this point we knew uh, you know, we're starting to doubt ourselves on where this vibration is coming from because the drive shaft's been out of the car twice and uh, we start looking, uh, looking at the other areas on the vehicle. We know it's related to the prop shaft. So confidence is high. We can go in there and start looking deeper at, at what's going on here. And, you know, the nice thing about this is that you're putting a number on your measurement and then you're making a change and then you're taking it out and, you know, making another recording. And you can tell whether or not you're making an improvement or not. And this, you know, is valuable because now you can show your customer, hey, you know, we took care of a problem here. And in this case, you know, we're, we told him, hey, we're going to really have to focus on this. And we suspect we have something going on with the drive, sh the, the drive axle. But hey, by the way, when we're done, 
uh, we, you know, we definitely have some tire vibrations here that are going to, you know, going to cause some problems here, and, and that's totally separate. That's not what we're working on here. So we're contracting to fix the prop shaft vibration. So let's go back over to the frequency here, and you'll see T1, T, T2, E1, T3. Now you can go over here where it says add vibration, and I'm just going to check off uh, or uncheck anything but a first order vibration to kind of clean this up a little bit. So we'll just check those off there and we'll just click anywhere off, off of that. You can see right away we have prop shaft, uh, first order vibration on the prop shaft. You see down here, there's quite a bit of vibration. This again is a lowered vehicle, the suspension travel and everything's been changed. Uh, you know, the, the vehicle you know, behavior is that of a modified vehicle. We have another view here called 3D frequency, which is kind of cool. And you can see right away that uh, kind of looks, you know, intriguing, intimidating, or what have you. So we can, we can uh, spread out our uh, x-axis here, and you'll see this is the frequencies that these vibrations are occurring at. Up here, you have time. So this is at 521 seconds and then 524 seconds, and that's defined inside of this, this window here. So if you wanted to add more time, you can do that, and you see all the samples that are coming up, okay? I mentioned earlier where uh, maybe the RPM and, and tachometer are incorrect, or you didn't bring those in. Do you see this little, um, this little, you know, like pin marker here? If you click on that, this is where you can actually edit the value. So you can say, hey, you know what? This was at 2,522 RPM and 67 miles an hour. You put that in here, and it will then identify the frequency that the vibrations are occurring and how they line up to other components that are rotating on the vehicle. So very, very powerful, uh, powerful tool. So let's just modify this uh, spread. So you can see right away, P1 is definitely a big, a big, uh, big problem here. Uh, so let's do this. I'm going to change the scaling a little bit so it kind of shows P1, shows also engine one vibration, you know, and there's our, there's our tire uh, issue here. So ideally what you would want to do is, you know, take it out, get, uh, get that vibration recorded, and when you go do your follow-up, you want to record in the uh, same mode of operation here. So uh, you can also, you know, put all the channels up here. So, you know, X, Y, and Z, you can see that, uh, you know, it just adds those individually and you can see which is happening more. If we go to back to the bar graph um, where we're looking at all the channels, you can see that A is fore and aft, okay? That's channel X. You've got Y, that's up and down, and then you've got Z happening side to side, okay? All right, so let's go take a look at the, uh, the fixed vehicle. So we'll go load, and I go down here and click on the fixed one. And as you can see right away that the prop shaft uh, Z-axis has been reduced down to about 32 millig's, uh, milligravity versus uh, 65. If we go to this sum, you can see now there's the sum value right there, 39.6. Tires are at 37.3. And so let's go look at our frequency. You can see that each time you open up a file, it's trying to show you the, uh, the, the orders of vibration that the software feels that are important for you to, to pay attention to. So we'll go back and uh, uncheck everything but the first order vibration and uh, click off here. And so we can see the P1 is you know right up here just below 41. You also have a really nice help file in this uh, application as well. So you see that the little question mark that pops up, uh, you click on that and it gives you a little uh, a hint about what's going on. And if you want to click through for more information, there's an awesome help file in here. Uh, I read pretty much all of this help file and this is really, really, really helpful. Uh, I can think back to, you know, times when I was trying to analyze a vibration problem 
And you know, you spend a lot of time doing that. And now, you know, when you do a correction, take it out and drive it, and you're looking for, you know, what's the delta between the uh, the, the before and after. This is really, really nice. So now that you, you can you can actually put a number on what's going on uh, with the vehicle and whether you're making a correction or not. So we'll look at the 3D frequency uh, spectrum page here. Let's go put our window over here. You can definitely see here, this uh, the black here. You can see that there was actually quite a bit of vibration uh, in the vehicle. And I'm gonna change the scaling on this a little bit. Again, this is that suspension and tires that are on the car, real low profile tires, a lot of road vibrations coming in there. But the prop shaft vibration, after we changed out the pinion shaft, totally corrected the, the issue. So um, we knew right away that the, the customer is going to be happy. And, and he was. He took it out for a drive and he said, oh my gosh, this is, uh, I got my truck back to the way it, the way it should be. Uh, and we can go back and look at our, our bar graph for this. And we go to channel view and uh, see what we're dealing with. So anyhow, this is, uh, you know, I can't, uh, can't tell you, uh, you know, how pleased I was to, to see this thing actually work and provide me with some valuable data. And if you get a chance to test this thing out, uh, whether it's at a trade show or maybe a buddy shop or, or a school or something that has one of these units, I would highly recommend you go out and play with it a little bit because you can get a lot of information out of this, this system. You can also see how sensitive this device is. If you go to the uh, setup screen, you know, when you're checking everything out, you can see right here the little sensitivity item here. And we just, we just tap on that a little bit and you see, you know, we've got a really, really good signal there. There are some other options for this, uh, this tool. You can um, pick up the, uh, there's an optical sensor, so you can actually do some on the car balancing of the drive shaft, where you would basically ch take ho hose clamps and it has a tutorial on how to, how to do that. You do some trial vibration, trial movement, and try to get that uh, drive shaft balanced out or find out where the mass needs to be placed and then you can weld something on there. So, so again, if you get a chance to, to test this thing out somewhere, um, I would uh, highly recommend it. Um, you know, cars today are built to be very, very smooth. Uh, customers really appreciate a nice, smooth running vehicle. And so when something goes wrong and when something's vibrating, whether it's maybe an engine mount, um, or whatnot, you'll be able to measure and put a number on what you're looking at and then make an adjustment, make a change and see whether or not you've actually made a difference. And documenting the data will definitely help with the customer and get them to understand exactly, you know, where you were, where you landed and whether or not the customer wants to pursue it any further or not. So anyways, thanks for watching this video. I know it was kind of long, but uh, I wanted to kind of describe what I experienced with this tool and uh, hope you check it out soon. Again, thanks for watching.